I just want to introduce myself. My name is Nicole McMahon and I work for LA Unified School District and I'm actually in the Crisis Counseling Intervention Unit. And I'm one of the supervisors for um, the Mental Health Evaluation Team. And today we put this presentation in collaboration with two of my officers, Officer Serrato and Officer Fonseca. Unfortunately, they're not able to be with us today. So we actually pre-recorded it and I'll go ahead and get started on the recording. I'll give it another minute and then I'll go ahead and start playing. I'll take all the questions at the end. Um, feel free to ask questions, but I will be taking them at the end. Good morning and welcome to the Los Angeles Unified School District Mental Health Evaluation Team uh, training here at the NAMI conference in 2020. My name is Nicole McMahon and I'm the specialist with the mental health evaluation team. And today I'm joined by my partner, Officer Serrato. And we wanted to give you a little glimpse into what LA Unified School District is doing to support student safety and to address um, mental health concerns with our students. So our objectives for today is to enhance your knowledge about the Welfare and Institutions Code 5585 and consumer rights to inform you about how LAUSD uses collaboration to support students experiencing a mental health crisis and to discuss continuity of care for students in the aftermath of a MET evaluation. So our mission statement as MET is to provide compassionate field intervention triage and appropriate linkages and services in situations involving students and staff dealing with or suffering from a mental health crisis. What does the response look like? The response is a collaboration between a school police officer, LA school police officer, in collaboration with the mental health practitioners. All our mental health practitioners are MSWs and the majority, 90% of them, carry an LSCSW, a licensed clinical social work um, credential. The teams are deployed in rotating deployment, which means that if the last team, if we have a team that went out last yesterday or came home last la yesterday, they'll be the first team to go out the next day. Um, on most of the days, we have at least six mental health evaluation team met units in the field handling all areas. So we don't separate them by um, areas. They're district wide and they support all the students and staff throughout the district. Another component is our officers ride in. This is pretty much a car similar to what they ride in, they ride an unmarked car. And the officers are dressed in a black polo shirt um, with a khaki khaki bottoms in which it allows them to have a bit of a softer uniform than traditional um, police uniform. MED is also, also considered cold responders. And what that means is we actually respond after the situation has been stabilized. So if there's a safety concern, um, of course, the safety concern is addressed by the uniformed personnel first, uniformed officers first, and then we come in um, as a tandem co-responders to support the mental health needs. Um, there are a lot of occasions where we may be the first responder in the sense that the student is calm, student is in the office and things are stabilized, then we don't have a problem um, being, the co being the first responder to the scene. So how did MET kind of come to an existence? In March, 2018, um, after the, the tragic shooting down in Florida, the Parkland shooting, um, the board came together and they, they asked for a board resolution. And the board resolution was safeguarding our schools, demanding common six gun laws and best practices to protect our students and staff. So shortly after that, it was a discussion about how can we collaborate together, mental health along with law enforcement to make sure that we are safeguarding and protecting our schools. Thus came the mental health evaluation team and we launched in August of um, 2018 at the beginning of the school year. We started hiring throughout that summer, but we actually officially started working and, and responding to calls in August, 2018. So why MET? As we look at the numbers and we look at the calls for service from school police, and that's the number of calls that school police gets in response to um, support needed, 
what we find are a few things. We find that over the years, our first year, we had 922 calls for service for a combination 5585. And for those who don't know, a 5585 is a minor, someone under the age of 18 who's experiencing a mental health crisis. And then we have 5150 are adults who are experiencing a mental health crisis. So a combination of those, 2017, 2018, were 922. In 2018, 2019, there were 1,882. And then 2019, 2020 school year, there were um, 1,371. And it's important to recognize that that number was up until March 13th when our school district, um, due to COVID-19, no longer um, what our school, our students were no longer in school. So our numbers drop significantly. Um, we have what's called an I-STARS um, system in LAUSD, and I-STARS stands for Incident System Tracking Accountability Report, and that's where we document um, any concerning behaviors and what ends up happening is that's where suicidal behaviors. What we found is that last year, last school year, there was a change in about, it dropped about 3,000 in the I-STAR reporting numbers. As a result, really, um, we believe that as a result of the school year kind of being abruptly put into a halt. Um, but based on the numbers, you can see that we were, we were 500 calls away from matching that of the year before. So that's something that we know that the numbers are increasing. Right now, it's um, difficult to, to count simply in the sense that with students not being in, we're not responding to as many calls, but we're still going out to homes as needed, as recognized by parents and teachers through the virtual world. Um, and the average in 2017, 2018 is about an average of eight calls per day. As I mentioned before, those numbers have dropped simply because um, we are not actually, the students aren't actually in school. So it's less opportunities for school staff to recognize the student in distress. Um, part of what we do as MED is really we follow up and we provide an opportunity to have continuity of care in the aftermath of a 72 hour hold, as well as to assist with the reentry when students are transported and taken on a 72 hour hold. What does that reentry plan look like? What does safety plan look like? And then if their student happens to be um, homicidal or danger to others, what is the threat assessment? management meetings look like afterwards? How do we make sure that we secure not only that student safety, but the safety of others as well? Hey, good morning. My name is Antonio Gerardo. I've been a part of MET for the last two years. And uh, what I'm gonna be presenting on is the actual code uh, descriptive in the uh, Welfare and Institutions Code, 5585. Uh, this code uh, defines when you what you need and what needs to be done when a minor uh, poses a danger to himself, danger to others, or is gravely disabled. Now, being a school police officer, the people that we service the most are our minors, right? We're assigned to schools and we come into contact with them all the time. Um, our officers in the academy usually get a fine descript description of what the 5150 code is, which is the adults. But a lot of our officers um, and even municipal officers are very confused when it comes to minors. So uh, being part of MET for the past two years, I was privileged to go a lot more information about dealing with the mentally ill, uh, especially minors. And as a good officer, what we did was we created a presentation to better inform our officers out in the field when responding to these calls. So the next few slides are the actual presentation that we, we present to our officers at school police. Um, first slide is the definition of 5585, which is when a minor poses a danger to himself, to others, or is gravely disabled, and the authorization for voluntary treatment is not available. Um, a peace officer or member of the attending staff as defined by regulation of an evaluation facility designated by the county or other professional person designated by the county may upon probable cause take or cause to be taken the minor into custody 
and place him or her in a facility designated by the county and approved by the State Department of Health Care Services as a facility for 72 hour treatment and evaluation of minors. The facility shall make every effort to notify the minor's parent or legal guardian as soon as possible as the minor is detained. So what we mean by that is um, if we're interviewing a minor and we discover that he, uh, he or she poses a danger to himself, what I mean by that is they, they de describe to us um, an incident where they're going to harm themselves or they're going to harm somebody else, right? They qualify for, for this um, particular 72 hour hold as long as there's no voluntary treatment available. What I mean by that, the voluntary treatment is um, on certain occasions, right? I, I've interviewed um, children. They do, in my mind, meet all the criteria for a 72 hour hold. And when I describe this to their parents, their parents um, don't believe me or they mistrust me and disregard what I'm telling them or what my partner is telling them. Um, a voluntary treatment is not an option. The parents are not gonna be taking them to a facility because they just are dismissive of anything we're saying. In this particular case, they do meet the criteria for 72 hour hold because they've already described their plan, intent and means to harm themselves and a voluntary option doesn't exist. Right, so um, I'm gonna touch a little bit more on gravely disabled. Um, gravely disabled is something that confuses a lot of people just because they don't understand it, especially when it comes to minors. Um, I, we had a situation um, a couple years ago where uh, we went ahead and transported somebody for gravely, disa it's, uh, gravely disabled, it was a minor. Um, we went to do a home visit. The child was sleeping sleeping in his bed and had not gotten out of bed for several days. He hadn't eaten and nor had he had showered. Um, now this is um, regardless of being provided with these facilities. He had access to a shower, he had access to food, but just what did not want to just did not want to do it. He just didn't want to take a shower, he didn't want to want to eat, he just wanted to lie there. In this particular case, we went ahead and transported him for gravely disabled because if he continued with that behavior, he would have severely harmed himself. Um, next slide, please. So um, this this uh, B code, the 5585.5 uh, parentheses B, talks about third party info. Uh, the highlighted portion on the bottom um, if the probable cause is based on statement of a person other than the officer, member of the attending staff or professional person, the person shall be liable in a civil action for intentionally giving a statement which he or she knows to be false. So we've had particular incidences where we go out and we try and talk to a child, but they're just non-responsive. What I mean by that is they don't want to talk to me. They don't want to talk to my civilian partner, right? Um, either because they fear any action that's going to be taken after that, or they just don't like the police, or they don't like uh, social workers. <laughs> but so um, if they had made contact with somebody prior to us arriving, such as a principal, such as a social worker there on campus, the, the school psychologist, um, we can transport uh, this minor on third party info. So um, the whole gives us that option, but we have to get the statements from that principal or from that social worker to add on to our hold. And anything that they tell us must be true, right? They can't, they can't try and fluff, fluff the situation with uh, added info. It all needs to be accurate. It all needs to uh, coincide with what the minor told them and they need to relay that uh, uh, over to us. So that way we can relay it over to the doctor. So um, that's very important because um, they can be civilly liable if they lie to us. Next slide, please. All right, so our initial response when going out to these calls is first we uh, gather background information. Um, when we do get a call to go out to a school or to a home, um, what I do on my end is I go ahead and call the responding officers. So 
we are uh, co-responders. So a uniformed officer is usually the first one, one to get to the scene. I will make contact with them and say, okay, can you tell me a little bit about wh what you have? What's the history? What's the, what's the child saying? Um, what's, um, what's the social worker on scene saying? How do you guys feel about this? Do I need a translator? Uh, something like that. Um, and also, uh, uh, we have additional services for our officers out in the field, just in case they don't need met. A lot, our officers are well-informed, right? But sometimes they need to bounce some questions off, off of us. Hey, uh, this is going on uh, with the child, but I'm not sure if you guys need to come, right? We will welcome those types of questions. Why? Because it makes everybody more comfortable with the decision that they're making out in the field. Um, if they do need translation services, we are able to provide them with the LAUSD number two, get those translation services, and also the determination to cuff. Um, what's great about our particular department right now is we, our concerned response is making us more comfortable with not cuffing these individuals out in the field, right? We want to let them know, yes, these people are in your custody, but they're not criminals. They're, they're people in crisis. And that's the way we want our officers to go out and um, come into contact with them with a concerned response of, of caring about their welfare. Next slide, please. Okay, so rapport building. Um, this is more of like a bridge. We like to see our officers uh, go out and, and, uh, and the language they use with, uh, with uh, the people they come into contact with. We um, give a particular set of, of ways of how to build rapport and how to build rapport quickly. Um, one is um, asking, how, how are you doing today, right? Did you eat today? Um, did, did anything happen today that, that uh, is different from any other day, right? We ask them to have a calm demeanor right and also to uh, mirror their images, which we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about in a bit. Um, we provide reassurances, um, uh, telling them that, look, you're not in trouble. Nothing, nothing you tell me is going to get you in trouble. I'm here because I care, and I, I want to make sure that, that you go home safely tonight. Um, we ask that our officers be honest. I never lie, never lie to the people that you come into contact with out in the field. Why? Because they can see that. They can see that you're generally, that you generally don't care. Right, so we ask. Look, be honest with them. Be um, be non-judgmental, and don't make any promises. Right, just let them know you're there to help. Next slide. So active listening, um, it requires the uh, listener to uh, fully concentrate and understand and respond to what's being said to them. Um, what I mean by that is. Um, when you're actively listening to someone, they'll, they'll tell you something. Well, today wasn't a good day. What I usually tell, tell uh, say after that is, oh, today wasn't a good day. I repeat what they say. Why? Because it lets them know, hey, I just heard what you said, right? And I want to know more about what's going on. Um, the, some of the keys to active listening is demonstrate concern by paying attention, paraphrase to, to show understanding, Use nonverbal cues such as nodding, eye contact, and leaning forward. Provide brief verbal affirmations such as I see, it sounds sounds like, and thank you for sharing sharing that. Um, you, you want to make sure that you uh, have open-ended questions. Uh, that is uh, that are designed to encourage a full, meaningful answer cannot be answered with a yes or no, but with specific detailed information. Closed-ended questions encourage a uh, sort or single word answer. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So uh, paraphrasing, uh, it shows you understand what is being said well enough to state it in your own words helps the person feel heard and understood. Um, I'm listening. I care about what you're, what you're saying. 
I'm doing my best to understand what you are going through, right? It, it lets them know that, hey, you are listening and you do care. It's just further um, understanding the, the verbiage that you're using that gets someone to understand you. Next slide. Okay, so this is something that I use all the time. And when I heard about it, I, I understood it uh, more when I used it out in the field, right? It's mirroring and reflecting. So um, in front of you, you see my sergeant off, off to the right, and he's sitting next to an adult female that he came into contact with out in the field. It's mirror imaging, right? She's sitting in a particular way. He sit, sat next to her in the same, the same way. Why? Because we find that when you do this, someone is more likely to feel comfortable with you and more likely to open up and and uh, give you the answers that you need to the, these particular questions that you're asking. Um, so if a, a child is sitting across from you, right, you, you sit through, across from them and mirror their images. If they have their hands placed on, placed on their knees, you put your hands placed on their knees. If they're crossing their legs, you cross your legs in the same particular uh, way that they, they have their legs crossed. So uh, plan intent and means, right? Um, this is something great that we began using and uh, began using it as a definition for officers to make a determination on whether they need to take someone on a 5585 hold. So um, intent, right? Does the child intend to harm someone or to harm themselves, right? How do we find this out? Well, ask, right? What, what are you going to do today? I'm going to go home and I'm going to, I'm going to hurt myself. Uh, well, how do you mean hurt yourself, right? Go, go through the plan with them. Well, how do you mean hurt, hurt yourself? Well, I plan on, on committing suicide today, right? Okay. How are you going to do that? Then start talking about the means. How are you going to commit suicide today? Well, I'm going to go home and I'm going to dot, 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 right? It's important to have a uh, understanding of their intent of what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how are they going to get it done. Sometimes um, the means that they, they express is going to be non-obtainable, right? If they said that they want to gain a certain item, and then commit an act of suicide, if they have no access to that particular item, it lessens somewhat of the, um, the threat that they're making. Next slide, please. So uh, Nicole is gonna talk about uh, what happens after met response. So once we've made a determination in terms of um, the mental health evaluation team has determined, or the officers in the field have determined that, you know what, the student either needs to go or doesn't need to go. What ends up happening is if a student is transported, then what we do is we primarily focus on the re-entry meeting. And what we do with that is we support the school site in determining what is needed to support student when they come back to school in addition to support the family and student into being able to identify those things. Um, whether it be like a change in classes, a schedule change, modifications to the schedule, lockers, um, uh, pick up, drop off, um, to figure out what the stressors are and how to support. And that includes uh, safety planning. In the moment that someone is actively suicidal and thinking of suicide or have, uh, has made an attempt, safety planning is kind of goes on the back burner at that point. But if we do not transport, we for sure make sure that we safety plan and support with linking that student to services in addition to safety planning both at home and school. And to do this, we work in collaboration with various other departments in the district. It may be um, special education. It may be the agencies that are working at the school. So if we have a school that has a contracted agency at the school site, it may be a referral to that agency because maybe um, the student wouldn't be able to access mental health services if they weren't there on campus. And that's a part of that collaboration that takes place in response to um, an aftermath of a meth response. And then most importantly, where do we go from here? 
One thing that's important is we want to continue training for the mental health evaluation team members in addition to those who are not members. Um, we want to make sure that the LA School Police Department is still being supported. We also want to make sure that um, as met, we're staying up to date on any resources in the community that can help support. So whether it be victims of crimes, many of our students have been victims and their families have been victims of crime that have led to um, their thoughts of suicide. It may be that the student has uh, disabilities and it may be a linkage to um, regional center or various different resources. And then of, co um, of course, commercially sexual exploitation of children. We wanna make sure that our students that are high risk and if we're doing the assessment, we hear some key things. Of course, we do our child abuse reporting, but to also make sure that we are staying abreast on what signs there are um, to say that somebody might be a CSEC victim or, um, or be a target. In addition to that, um, we go out and do a lot of training for LAUSC staff and community partners to make sure that they have access and they are aware of mental health evaluation team on what we do, where resources are available. Um, we've done over 100 trainings to over 3,000 different individuals. So we go from community partners, those, those partners that are in our schools and let them know because our services are available to them because they're working with our students as long as the kids are at school or at home. Um, as uh, Serato said, we actually focus on training the patrol officers because we recognize that MET can't be everywhere all the time. And we wanna make sure that our officers are supported, our officers have what they need. And then in addition to that, we also make sure that we enhance our relationships with the local mental health um, emergency responders. So down here in Los Angeles, it's the Department of Mental Health. And so we wanna make sure that we keep in contact with them and make sure that we are um, working in collaboration when needed. And then in the hospitals as well. So we wanted to provide this opportunity today for you all to see kind of what the future of police work and collaboration can look like when working collaboratively with mental health professionals, particularly in a school setting. And then lastly, are there any questions? Wanted to give you now an opportunity um, for us to review the Q&A and answer any questions you may have. So thank you. I'm going to go ahead and I can answer any questions either live or in the chat that you may have. Um, now is the time. Thank you for being with us to ask any questions you may have. Eugenia, are there any questions in the uh, Wobble, in the app? You can go ahead and unmute yourself if you have any questions. We'll give it, we'll leave, we'll leave it open for a little bit. Any questions about the work that we're doing down here in Los Angeles? Any questions about the model? No? My moderator will um, unmute you if you have any questions. And like, Any questions? I 
I just, I want to give a shout out. I see some of um, the team down there in Los Angeles. Uh, some of the officers have joined us today to say hello. Um, I don't know if you all, if, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to the, the team uh, met officers. I see a few of you on here today. I don't know if you wanna. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Silas, how are you? What is going on? First of all, fantastic presentation. Whoever these Met guys are, they really know, they look like they know what they're talking about and they're really, they're really skilled at what they do. Thank you, Silas. I'm glad you're one of those guys. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else have any comments or, um, I do wanna say this, um, we are sensitive to the language that we use. I know that uh, Serato said committed suicide. That's something that we continue to work on. Uh, we say die by suicide down here. That tends to be our language. I think he just had a mishap in the presentation, but I did want to acknowledge it because I didn't want it to be offensive to anyone. And I wanted to make sure that we were sensitive and I acknowledged that um, that error in the presentation. We were, we were strapped on time and didn't want to continue to reschedule our time that we had at the same um, at the same time. Any uh, any questions, Gina? If there are no questions, I'm um, not. Sure. Yes, someone had a question. I was just gonna say I gave you guys the ability to unmute yourselves. Um, so if you have any questions um, for Nicole, please ask the, ask away. We have a few minutes still. We have a couple more minutes. So with, with no questions arising, I just wanna make sure I uh, say thank you for um, being on here. The slides will be available. Um, the actual actual presentation will be available. It's in, it'll be on the, on the app for your viewing later as well. Okay. Eugenia, did you want to close it out? Just put something out. Yep. Are the slides going to be available? Yes. Um, they're in NAMI West LA and work closely in the school system um, for, yeah, with ending the silence program. So we appreciate your work. Thank you so much for that. We want to, um, you know, whenever you want us to get in contact, feel free. You can message, um, send me an email and we could touch bases and try to work collaboratively, but that's great. Nicole, thank you so much for taking the time to present this useful information. And um, again, um, they can always email you. Thank yep. you so much. I'll put my email in the chat. I'll actually do that now for everyone. Yeah, that would be good. Um, All right. All right. I put I put my email in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, go ahead and end it there, Eugene. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank, Thank you, Nicole. You.